Hello, I'm Matthew McLean of Yap Audio Production and I'd like to congratulate Jack and David for the Sonic Society's 10 year milestone. Keep up the good work guys. My jacket, I fear, not to mention the edges of my eyebrows. Ooh. Thank goodness I was able to identify the wavelength of the beam and using my sonic screwdriver. Now, where did that go? Oh no. Here you go, little fella. Setting up a barrier to modify the beam in such a way as it would harmlessly pass through was too much. The sonic screwdriver is fried. Entirely. Feels like I've just lost an old friend. What's this? Oh, seems like we're now located back over the once and future nerd pod space. Well then we're travelling, but whatever for? According to the readouts, we're over parts three and four. The Once and Future Nerd Book 1 Princes of Jordan Chapter 2 Life in a Corner Episode 3 Brennan dreamt of an infinite table. Well, we've already covered the limitations of the human mind, etc., etc. He dreamt of an incomprehensibly long table. This particular table was set for an, ahem, infinite number of guests. But only three figures sat around the table. Brennan sat alone on one side. Across from him sat a young girl. Her appearance was exactly the same as it was in Brennan's previous dream, down to the eerily serene look and gaping puncture wound. Beside her sat a figure composed entirely of white light. A golden halo sat on its head. Between Brennan and the two figures sat a large, ornate silver platter which one would expect to hold the main course of the banquet. This platter held the beautiful bird. The bird was splayed out on the silver as if stuffed and roasted, yet clearly still alive. It lifted its graceful red and gold neck and looked directly at Brennan. The bird's obsidian eyes caught Brennan's brown ones for a brief moment before the bird weakly lowered its head. The girl spoke. There are seven things you must know to save me. The second thing is, the king has loved my enemy. From the darkness behind the girl and the creature of light, a third figure materialized, the nightmare demon, the indescribable horror. Neither the girl nor the figure of light could see the demon behind them. In the fashion of nightmares, Brennan found himself unable to act, unable to warn the girl, unable to tear his eyes away from the demon. Almost casually, the demon extended a clawed hand and tore out the throat of the figure of light. The horror carefully lifted the golden halo off of the light and placed it on its own head. 
As soon as the gold touched the dark skull, the figure of light disappeared. The demon lifted the bird off of the table, its red and gold wings protesting weakly. As the demon tore off the bird's head with its teeth, the golden halo turned red and blood poured down the demon's face. The sun had barely appeared over the horizon the next morning when Brennan entered the barn. Good morning, old man. Regan was sitting the final watch by the door. Have you seen your charming dear friend? He seems to have disappeared. You are aware that farmers do actually have business to attend to sometimes. This early? Keith Kelly had business to attend to. Keith Kelly? The one back at the rat that sold me out? Whose face I set on fire before I drowned him in his own blood? <laughs> I've been killing men since before your mother was a coin in some street urchin's pocket. Captain Briarhelm served under me in four campaigns. But he did. You think you can frighten me with threats of violence? Or him? So do you two still fuck? You impudent little horse whelp. You know nothing. I don't care what you put your cock in, Brennan. I'd just rather know beforehand. Secrets and spurned lovers are a bad combination. Secrets and disrespect for children are even worse. Good luck training your fierce warriors up there. With that, Regan turned and left the barn. Brennan stood in silence for a moment, marinating in his anger. After a deep breath, he turned to the task at hand. Everyone up. Three minutes to get dressed and armed. Some twenty minutes later, the group stood in their best guess at a military formation in the field outside the barn. Their best guess was woefully inadequate. Billy was wearing an odd mix of his old football gear and his new mail, with the extra pieces in a heap at his feet. Jen's hair was dreadfully tangled in her new armor. Even Nelson's armor was disheveled, in that some buckles were belted to the third hole and some to the fourth. You should understand that had we been ambushed, you would all be dead right now. It's my understanding that knights would usually have squires to help them put on armor. We don't. Plan accordingly. I'm just saying, I think we did pretty well for our first attempt. As if to defy Nelson's claim, the codpiece of Billy's armor chose this moment to clatter loudly to the ground. With a sigh, Brennan set to work. The first lesson was in the use of sword and shield. Nelson, try to strike Billy. Billy, try to block it. Nelson needed both hands to even get his sword off the ground. With a great heave, he managed to swing the weapon towards Billy. The motion spun Nelson's entire body in a circle, and he nearly fell from the effort. Billy hefted the weight of the sword more comfortably, but no more correctly. As Nelson's swing slowly approached Billy, Billy managed to move his own sword into the path to block the blow. The swords clashed. Rather, they would have clashed if either combatant had any strength or skill behind their blows. Instead, the swords made rather dull thud. Wrong! How do you think they blunted those swords? Block with your shield. That's what it's for. If you absolutely must block with your sword, try to deflect the blow. Come, Billy. The old general made an exaggeratedly slow swing of his own sword directly at Billy's shield. Billy smiled at his perceived success. Better. Again. Brennan took another swing at Billy. And then another, and another. Billy's use of the shield was surprisingly not abysmal, until the weight of the metal and the shock of the blows began to drag on his shield arm. In a few seconds, he was struggling even to hold the shield, but Brennan would not relent. The old general continued to batter Billy's shield until he dropped it entirely. One sharp tap to the top of the helmet, and Billy was flat on his back on the ground, breathing heavily. I thought you said you were an athlete. Brennan quickly realized the futility of teaching the finer points of swordsmanship at this moment, and assigned them the task of working on their arm strength instead. Billy found a suitable beam inside the barn, and set to repeatedly hefting his own weight against it in a tactic he called a pull-up. 
Nelson and Jen were resting beside the barn when Nia approached. Are we going to learn any magic? The general wants you to learn some basic fighting skills quickly. You won't get far with magic in just a few days. Well, I don't exactly think we're cut out for broadswords. I don't know. I might be able to get it if I work out a little more. Let's face it, Jen. Neither of us is what you picture when you think famous swordsman. I see your point. Have a seat. And so the day of training continued. In the nearby forest, a rabbit, in fact, a distant descendant of the venerable Mr. Fluffy Toes, did honor to his ancestor by participating in the noble task of creating new rabbits. This is not particularly relevant to our story, but is more interesting than describing ten hours of practice with sword and shield. The children worked hard and slept well. The next morning, they reacted to Brennan's three-minute wake-up call in a mere eight minutes. Getting better. Today you might even have had time to beg for mercy before your enemy delivered his killing strike. Thus convened another rather boring day of training. Brennan continued to drill the children in basic sword work. Their skills slowly improved from embarrassing to simply dreadful. They earned a break for lunch, and then in the afternoon Nia began to teach the children about her abilities. We are in Jordan, the physical world. Selberin is the spiritual world. Everything in the Yordic plane, the wind, the sea, the rocks, everything, has a counterpart in Selberin. Almost like a reflection. Each Yordic object is bound to the will of its Selberic counterpart. Or more accurately, uh, never mind, let's stay sketchy. The Yordic ocean is wet because the Selberic ocean wills it to be so. To use what you call magic is to bend the will of other things to your own. In the tavern, I wanted the beer to be cold, so I reached out to its Selberic essence and bent its will to my own. Awesome. What spells can we cast right now? You mustn't try spell casting without extensive study beforehand. It would be extremely dangerous. But what if one of us was the anointed one, like in Brennan's dream? I can't claim to know. You're saying water has a will? Yes, but it's not that simple. Imagine cutting a drop of water in half. Imagine cutting the halves in half. Imagine cutting a drop of water into parts so small that smaller parts would not be water. Molecules. Oslets, they are called. Each oslet in a drop of water has a will. Together they comprise the will of the drop. And the wills of all the drops of water comprise the will of the sea. So what about those rabbits over there? Or, or even a person? People are made of mol... oslets? Can you force people to your will the way you force the beer? Living things certainly have a Selberic essence, but it seems their wills cannot be bent. The scholarship disagrees on why, though this is actually the subject of my research. Some have suggested that enough oslets bound together may form a sort of wall, greater than the sum of its parts. Scripture calls it the uncorruptible soul. Incredible. That's what I've been trying to tell you guys about the rich mythology. No, I, I mean that they've developed basic atomic theory and an emergent theory of consciousness. An emergency of what now? It's a footnote in the bio textbook. That evening, having been dismayed by what she saw earlier, Regan took her turn at instruction. She fought with her own sword, a modification of the Mooncrest style. The blade was thin and razor sharp on one edge. Billy actually managed to get his shield in the way of each strike. Not bad. You're bleeding, though. What? Where? Billy dropped his shield, using his now free arm to feel around for a cut. Regan took that opportunity to flick her blade almost too fast to see. A drop of blood welled up on Billy's left cheek. Your cheek. Regan called Nelson in for his first lesson just after dinner. Nelson returned with a cut on his left cheek, and also a peculiar stumble to his gait, a telltale sign of Regan's preferred fighting style. What happened to you? I was unscrupulously deceived. Your turn, girly. Can you make me some ice, please? Of course, child. Jen only shook slightly as she went off into the woods with the armed woman. But when Regan began swinging her blade, Jen held her own with the shield. Not bad. You're bleeding, though. Nice try. <laughs> Good girl. I thought you were smarter than you let on. Billy, put your clothes back on. Huh? As you might have guessed, 
Billy was nowhere to be seen. Instead, Regan grabbed Jen's hair, pulled her close, and nicked her left cheek with the tip of her blade. More free advice. Lose the hair. And your little game cock. One of them will get you killed. At the end of the fourth day of training, Billy's skills had progressed enough so that he could nearly keep pace with Brennan's drills. Block. Bash. Strike. Recover. Block. Bash. Strike. Recover. Eventually, Block. however, strike. he still recover. flagged. At the end of one particular drill, as Billy's shield arm slowed, Brennan changed the pattern slightly by throwing a mailed fist directly at Billy's face. The punch stopped a mere whisper's length away from Billy's still quite broken nose. Their skilled armed combat. Form matters, but at the end of the day, you're still just breaking a man's body until he's dead. Never forget that, lad. Meanwhile, Jen and Nelson had resumed their instruction with Nia. So how do you bend the wills of other things? You must commune with Selberin. Some, like myself, find this easier with the aid of a holy object. She held aloft her staff. Others may use song. Summoners employ a familiar from Selberin. Okay, but none Wait, of this... you're telling me I'm not only in a place where I can become an actual wizard, but I can do it by communing with demons and spirits and shit? Demons. Something about the word demon nagged at Jen's memory. It somehow related to a nearly forgotten lecture from Valley Central High School. Summoning is not to be undertaken lightly. There are dark and chaotic forces in Selberin as well as benevolent ones. Summoners train for years before their first conjuration to make sure they only contact the forces they want. As Nelson became enraptured by the talk of spirits, Jen recalled something about a philosopher named Maxwell. And there are some summoners who intentionally contact the forces of destruction. She focused intently on a patch of dry grass. I say truly, they lose their souls in the process. What about incantations? Some mages find them useful for focusing their minds. Through her concentration, Jen thought she could detect a tiny wisp of smoke rising from the dry foliage. Nelson, are you still up the teacher's ass? Jen's concentration was immediately broken, and the wisp of smoke, if indeed it existed, was gone. What are you doing over here, Jenny? She's telling us about emergent theories of consciousness. Huh? <laughs> uh, something, something I saw in CSI. Oh yeah, that show's gay. Later that evening, Jen and Billy had once again retreated to the privacy of the hayloft. Billy was vigorously applying saliva to Jen's face. Jen's facial expression indicated her mind was elsewhere. How would you feel if I cut my hair? What? Like, if I cut my hair short. We have to talk about this now? Well, I was just thinking about it a lot today. Billy, for once, sensed that there was no recovering the amorous mood. Frustrated, he disentangled himself from Jen. Like how short? Like lesbian short? I don't know, like Regan short? Is that where this is coming from? You want to be like Regan now? No. God, no. I don't want to be like her, but she knows how to survive around here. Maybe short hair is smart. I'm scared, Billy. I don't make you feel safe? No, I didn't mean anything about- Fine. Cut your hair then. <sighs> what? Cut it. I need- some fresh air. Jen turned and stormed down the ladder, as much as one can storm down a ladder. Alone, she paced under the moon and stars. She paced and paced, and the full moon climbed from the horizon up to its apex. Finally, she stopped pacing. Jen grabbed her hair in a fist and pulled it in front of her face. She stared at her beautiful locks for a long moment. With a sigh, she drew the knife from the hilt at her waist and brought the blade up to the base of her ponytail. She was just about to chop it all off when a dirty hand grabbed her wrist. A second hand roughly covered Jen's mouth, preventing her from screaming. With frightening skill, the one hand twisted Jen's wrist until her grip on the knife loosened. The hand then grabbed the knife and placed it firmly at Jen's throat. A stranger's voice hissed at her. Hello, lovely.
For additional information and bonus content, access onceandfuturenerd.com on your computer machine. The Once and Future Nerd is written and created by Zach Glass and Christian Madeira. It is performed by Garrett Armin, Hayes Dunlop, Anya Gibbian, Ian Harkins, Emily Kukuk, Frank Queris, Julie Reed, Perry Strong, and Dylan Uremovich. It is co-executive produced by Jess Kelly and directed and edited by Christian Madeira. Production sound engineering is done by Gary O'Keefe, with dialogue editing and foley by Tommy Stang, and post-production mixing and sound design by Sandra Ramirez. Theme music is composed by Tom Lee. Thanks for downloading... Once and Future Nerd Book 1 Princes of Jordan Chapter 2 Life in a Corner Episode 4 You don't need to get hurt I just need to know where Arona Regan is. Scream and I'll kill you, though. Understand? Jen had found herself once more abruptly at the uncomfortable end of a knife. The knife was held by a rather grimy-looking man. Where is she? I didn't see her when I got out of bed. You're making yourself expendable. Okay, okay, if I were Arona Regan, what would I be doing right now? Suddenly, Jen's eyes focused past the grimy man's shoulder as she gestured wildly with both hands, pointing behind the man. I'd be uh, running away behind you! What? The grimy man turned his back on Jen. Jen, as you may have guessed, had recalled Irona Regan's preferred fighting style and took the opportunity her lie had created to kick the man, as Billy would say, <coughs> square in the nuts. <coughs> her assailant doubled over in pain, dropping the knife in the process. Jen grabbed the blade and ran towards the barn. Wake up! Wake up! Brennan had been on watch at the door of the barn. In no time at all, he was running to Jen. He took a quick look around the field to assess the situation and then herded Jen back into the building. Yilloween was already prepared for a battle, bow drawn. Nia stood with her staff at the ready, although she couldn't quite mask the fear in her eyes. Nelson was fumbling with his armor, barely awake. Out here, with me. Where's Regan? She wasn't here when I awoke. Good thinking. Hide the children, too. Nia grabbed Nelson by the hand and pulled him towards the ladder up to the loft. Jen followed. Halfway up the ladder, they ran into Billy, who was climbing down with most of his armor surprisingly put on correctly. Where are you going? I heard Jen yell. Get over there. Stay low. Stay quiet. What? We've been training to fight. For a week. They've trained their whole lives. Now hide. Brennan and Yellowwind ran out of the barn. They ran directly into a semicircle of men who had been watching the entrance to the barn with their own weapons raised. This don't have to be a bloodbath. Just tell us where Arona Regan is. I wish we knew. Well, you're going to help us look, or we're going to kill you all. All the armed men wore a blue bandana around their left arms, indicating their affiliation to the same mercenary company. You sewer trash. Have you any idea whom you're threatening? Don't really give a sword. The men all snickered at this, as though it were a clever joke. Nia and the children found a small window that looked out over the barn entrance. From this vantage, they could see the excitement outside and just barely hear the conversation. This is bullshit. Oh, you serve the High King, do you? Why didn't you say so? People keep trying to kill us, and we gotta be pussies about it? Be quiet. We can't kill you then. 
It didn't make a sound noise. The men all burst out laughing. Stop talking, for I put this knife up your arse. What in Selberin are you doing out here? At that moment, a second group of extremely dirty, heavily armed men came running out of the woods. These men all had red bandanas around their right arms. Rickard? Anders? Is that you? I suppose we's out here for the same thing. <laughs> Not every day someone tells you where to find the thief queen of Armstrongard. At this, Brennan paid careful attention. I thought I was the only one crazy enough to believe that old buggering popper, though. In the part of a man's mind that makes horrible truths unavoidable once made plain, Brennan immediately realised to whom this comment referred. How do you suppose we resolve this? Well, I think that's obvious. We was here first. No, you wasn't. We was waiting in them woods all day to ambush her. You just come running out first. Well, we ain't going anywhere. Yellowin swung his bow back and forth between the leaders of the two groups, unsure of which was the more urgent target. Neither are we. Which means we can either cut each other to pieces and wait for Arona Regan to finish us off, or we can split the bounty. Now, be honest, 15 men against the Rona Regan's a gamble anyway. Mm, all right, you sneaky bastard. You've got yourself a god's damn deal. The two crews of mercenaries, who had turned their weapons towards each other earlier, now turned their swords towards their common purpose, Brennan and Yellowin. Thirty men now stood against the old soldier and the young elf. You finish off these two. I'll try around back, and we'll sort out the money later. Sounds like a night at your mom's house. That quip, of course, came from the infinitely clever mind of Billy. He had been listening to the whole conversation from above, and decided to ignore Nia's warnings. The sellsword's response, however, was entirely unexpected. You backstabbing sod! I told you my family history in confidence. I never told no one. You lie! How dare you! It's not my fault your mum would drop her breeches for a half piece. How's about we bring up your drunkard of a father? Don't you dare! Can't say I blame him. I'd drink myself stupid too if I'd stuck my cock in your so of a mum and all I had to show for it was you. I'll wear your eggs for a necklace, you shit! All of a sudden, the two mercenary captains were fighting each other, their swords clashing loudly. The rest of each company followed suit, and within moments, an all-out brawl between the Red Arms and the Blue Arms had commenced. Brennan and Yellowin stood not two feet away, utterly forgotten by the mercenaries. I need to see to the children. Can you clean up what's left here? Should not be a problem. Brennan went into the barn and found the rest of the party in the loft. What the fuck's going on out there? Nia, that was quick thinking with Regan. But I need to know where she is now. Quick thinking? Saying you hadn't seen her. I haven't seen her. Any of you? Brennan had another moment of horrible realisation and rushed back down the ladder. Outside, Yellowin watched with the expression of a fanatic at a sporting event. The two mercenary leaders locked in single combat, the corpses of their followers strewn at their feet. The red armband saw an opening and pushed forward, only to slip on a pile of gore from one of his fallen comrades. Blue armband did not waste his opportunity, smashing his mace into his opponent's face. Red armband crumpled, and blue armband raised his hands in celebration. His celebration was rather short-lived, though, as an arrow pierced his left eye. For good measure, Yellowin put another into red armband as well. Brennan sprinted past. Brennan found Bowen Briarhelm sitting alone at the head of his table, lit only by moonlight. Empty bottles were strewn around the former soldier. Now we're square. Those men could have killed any of my charges, even the innocent ones. And you killed me the second you brought her here. 
I asked you, Brennan, I asked you if she was trouble. I came the closest I'll ever come to begging. And you lied. I could have protected you if you hadn't betrayed us. From some snot-nosed bounty killers, sure. What about the bankers? I offered you money. I'll Just be like damned for I take a coin of your fucking allowance from Gunther. Then that's your pride, damn you. I'm not innocent, but don't dare lay this all at my feet. You've some nerve to talk to me about pride, you son of a whore. After all your talk about what's expected of a man. Honour isn't the same as pride. No, pride's when you refuse to break the rules you set for yourself. Honour's when you let everyone else set the rules for you. Honour is all we have when men cannot be trusted to set rules for themselves. <sighs> it's so easy for you, isn't it? So easy when you can hide what you want behind the honourable things. It's never been easy. That's why they call it honour. Was it easy to ruin me with a lie? Was it easy for you to betray us? You first. My hands were tied, Bowen. My orders... God damn you, you're lying again! Don't hide behind orders or honour or duty. How is his majesty? Old, sick, and under siege. Me too? To answer your question, yes. When I overheard those sword-clanging peasants in the bar and realised several brandies into the day that you lied, yes, betraying you was the easiest thing I've ever fucking done. Well, maybe the second easiest. It's dealing with it after I'd done it that's hard. You came here to kill me before she does, didn't you? Bowen. Lying to a dying man's a curse on your house. Aye. But now that you're looking me in the eyes, you ain't got the piss in you to do it, have you? No. But you can't stop her, can you? Thirty years ago. Maybe. If what I've heard about her is true, you let a mad bitch off the chain. I don't think she's mad. I think she spent her whole life trapped in a corner. Haven't we all? Then, Bowen Briarhelm let out a soft groan. Blood burbled out of his mouth, and his eyes rolled sickeningly. Regan twisted her sword between Briarhelm's neck and shoulder, and then yanked it free. Blood sprayed from the body, covering the rogue and a large portion of the room. I suppose it would have been naive to ask you to show him mercy. That was mercy. What did he want done with his body? Had Regan been anyone other than who she was, the blankness on Brennan's face would have terrified her. She left him alone to his emotions, but returned a few moments later, dragging the corpse of one of the mercenaries behind her. This mercenary, notably, was built similarly to the late Bowen Briarhelm. Moreover, he had had his face mutilated beyond recognition. You're going to help me get this guy into your friend's clothes. Then you can do whatever you want with his body. But make damn sure you bury him deep enough that no one will find him. And Brennan? Now we're square. For additional information and bonus content, access onceandfuturenerd.com on your computer machine. New episodes are released every other Sunday. The Once and Future Nerd is written and created by Zach Glass and Christian Madeira, and directed and edited by Christian Madeira. It is performed by Garrett Armin, Hayes Dunlop, Anya Gibeon, Ian Harkins, 
Emily Kukuk, Frank Querez, Julie Reed, Perry Strong, and Dylan Yuremovich. It is co-executive produced by Jess Kelly. Production sound engineering is done by Gary O'Keefe, with dialogue editing and foley by Tommy Stang, and post-production mixing and sound design by Sandra Ramirez. Theme music is composed by Tom Lee. Thanks for downloading. Here now, this seam seems to be a little out of place. The sonic screwdriver certainly identified the material as being Videk before it was destroyed. Bad form on them for that. I'll have to take it up with their supervisor, whoever that is, but what's this? Hmm. Yes, it would seem that the metal seam here would represent some kind of access hatch. Now, if only I had a way to activate the proper source key. Yo yo. Mmm, get it, babies. No, that's far too cliche. Uh, ah, yes, of course, I'd forgotten I'd grabbed my psychic paper after the last trip. Here it is. And if my calculations are correct. Hmm, right on schedule. Well, let's see where this takes us, shall we? The Sonic Society Season 10 is written and produced by Jack J. Ward and David Alt, with original music provided by Sharon B. at SharonB.com. All features, interviews and audio drama shorts are owned completely by their originators and provided to the Sonic Society through Creative Commons licensing. The Sonic Society itself originates from Halifax, Nova Scotia, Canada. This has been an Electric Vicuna production. Hi, this is Pete Lutz, the director and producer of Pulpery Theatre. Watch for our monthly podcast of all new audio dramas adapted from or written as an homage to vintage pulp fiction stories. Like us on Facebook to receive updates, 63 Audio by Pete Lutz, and our website, 63audio.f6.3studio.com.